Mr. Speaker, Mr. Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans, will we allow ourselves to be sorted into factions and turned against one another? Or will we recapture the sense of common purpose that has always propelled America forward? The president says he doesn't like when factions turn us against each other, but unfortunately those factions are a result of the policies that he champions. When you have a government that's taking from people to give to other people, we will naturally form groups to fight over the spoils. Our high school graduation rate has hit an all-time high. More Americans finish college than ever before. We do have more people graduating high school than ever before, but they don't seem to be learning anything more. So if you look at National Assessment of Educational Progress scores, they've been essentially stagnant for 40 years. Meanwhile, spending per pupil has more than doubled. When it comes to college, we have, again, more people who are graduating. We have a lot more certificates and degrees and sheepskin out there. But the reality is the labor market can't possibly use all those people. So about a third of people with a bachelor's degree are in jobs that don't require it. It's even worse when you talk about people with graduate degrees. So essentially when we say we should give away more college and we should get more people through college, we're selling them a false bill of goods, promising that they're gonna get a whole lot of benefit out of more education that we simply can't deliver. Today we have new tools to stop taxpayer-funded bailouts and a new consumer watchdog to protect us from predatory lending. Rather than ending bailouts, financial reform actually labels certain companies as too big to fail, essentially guaranteeing that these companies will be rescued in the next crisis. Additionally, financial reform limits consumer choices, eliminating certain invaluable products while raising the cost of credit. And these policies will continue to work as long as politics don't get in the way. We have politics because people actually disagree with each other over the best policies. So when the president says he'd like to get rid of politics, get politics out of the way, what he really means is he would simply like us to stop disagreeing with him. We gave our citizens schools and colleges. The federal government didn't give us schools and colleges. The president didn't build that. From the very beginning of our history, the American people on their own pursued education. They established elementary schools and colleges all over the country. What ultimately happened was government came in and said, well, we'll help you pay for that. And then what happened was when the government money came in, we started to have control by special interests. We started to have bureaucratic control. And that's when we went from powerful, responsive education to bureaucratically controlled, special interest controlled educational stagnation. I want to spread that idea all across America so that two years of college becomes as free and universal in America as high school is today. Based on what we've seen in performance from high schools, where we've had decades of stagnant achievement, probably the worst thing we could do for our community colleges is make them as free and as government funded and as government controlled as American high schools. So no one knows for certain which industries will generate the jobs of the future. Least of all government. Uh, the president's middle class economics isn't going to work for exactly that reason. But we do know we want them here in America. The problem is President Obama has not done anything to make America a better place for businesses to invest. The United States has the highest corporate tax rate in the world and President Obama has done nothing to bring that rate down. I'm the first one to admit that past trade deals haven't always lived up to the hype. And that's why we've gone after countries that break the rules at our expense. But 95% of the world's customers live outside our borders. This was a big opportunity for the president to make the case for freer trade, to argue that it's good for the United States and good for the world. Instead, he equivocates and argues that his free trade agreements will be less bad than other ones and might be good for business. Uh, he needed to make the case to liberal Democrats to support his ambitious trade agenda. Uh, and he seems to have failed to do that. And tonight I call on this Congress to show the world that we are united in this mission by passing a resolution to authorize the use of force against ISIL. Great, but for six months now we've been at war in Iraq and Syria without any legal authority whatsoever. Meanwhile, President Obama claims that a 13-year-old congressional resolution gives him the power to go to war with virtually any jihadist group anywhere in the world. This is a president who's bombed at least seven countries, who has launched six times as many drone strikes as his predecessor, 
and whose Pentagon tells us that the war on terror will go on at least 10 to 20 years more. In last year's State of the Union, for anybody keeping score, the president said, America must move off a permanent war footing. When exactly? And on Cuba, we are ending a policy that was long past its expiration date. So many of President Obama's policies are based on things that have been tried and failed in the past, but at least in one case, he's willing to admit that a longstanding policy has failed and should end. That's the policy of trying to isolate Cuba by denying Americans their basic freedom, freedom to trade, travel to a country just 90 miles away. Congress should follow his recommendations and end the embargo now. No foreign nation, no hacker, should be able to shut down our networks, steal our trade secrets, or invade the privacy of American families, especially our kids. If the president wants to improve cybersecurity, the first order of business should be to get his own house in order. Uh, first, improving the federal government's terrible track record on data breaches of federal systems, tens of thousands every year, and then also ensuring that the NSA is not working to degrade security, uh, both directly by weakening encryption standards or by stockpiling vulnerabilities and information about cyber threats that it ought to be sharing with the private sector. Instead, we hear about laws to make it easier for the private sector to let information flow to the government. But there's just no evidence that that is a cybersecurity problem that needs to be addressed. And if we don't act forcefully, we'll continue to see rising oceans. Sea levels have been rising for 20,000 years since near the end of the last ice age. There's no government in the world that can stop geology. The United States will double the pace at which we cut carbon pollution and China committed for the first time to limiting their emissions. What China really said was they, quote, intend to cap their emissions, quote, around the year 2030. Well, by then, they probably will be emitting between two and three times as much as we do per year. How in the world is that going to do anything about global warming? So while some have moved on from the debates over our surveillance programs, I have not. As promised, our intelligence agencies have worked hard with the recommendations of privacy advocates to increase transparency and build more safeguards against potential abuse. So I'm glad the president is still interested in the surveillance debate, but it doesn't sound like he's asking Congress to do anything here. And it would be so easy to ask them to move forward with the reforms that his own intelligence community has already said would protect American privacy without hampering the essential intelligence mission. Uh, internal reforms are great, but those can be thrown aside in secret any day. I know how tempting such cynicism may be, but I still think the cynics are wrong. As he's done before, the president is once again labeling his cynicism what is actually a skepticism about his policies, a belief that maybe they won't work quite as well as he tells us they will. And if there's anything we've learned in the last six years, it's that that skepticism is probably warranted. Passions still fly on immigration, but surely we can all see something of ourselves in the striving young student and agree that no one benefits when a hardworking mom is snatched from her child and then it's possible to shape a law that upholds our tradition as a nation of laws and a nation of immigrants. Immigration is one policy area where President Obama has significantly improved his positions. When he first took office in 2009, it could fairly be stated that he was the deporter in chief. He increased both border security and deportations from the interior of the United States. But since 2011, he has decreased enforcement and has legalized some portions of the American illegal immigrant population. As a result, I think this president has certainly improved his positions in the United States. For the first time in 40 years, the crime rate and the incarceration rate have come down together. The incarceration rate has dropped slightly, yet the United States still imprisons more than any other country on Earth. If the president wants a criminal justice system that works for us all, he can start by calling for an end to the war on drugs. A brighter future is ours to write. Let's begin this new chapter together. There's nothing in the Constitution that mandates this annual primetime speech from the throne. And there's nothing stopping us from putting an end to this pompous spectacle and going back to the old Jeffersonian tradition. Next year, President Obama could do us all a favor by just mailing it in. Thank you. God bless you. God bless this country we love. You.